Hey everybody, today we're going to try to do a quick deep dive into the 2024 presidential election. It's going to be for early to mid-July, and I last did this more than three months ago in April. There's been a lot that's happened in the past three months, and we've still got more than three and a half months to go until the election. So we've got a lot to cover in this. We're going to cover the background, the candidates, the debates, the polling, and the outlook. So the quick opening headline is U.S. has its first presidential rematch since 1956. So about a year ago, this is pretty much the matchup that most Americans did not want to see. But it looks like we've got it anyway. And regardless of how much dissatisfaction there might be for Biden or for Trump or for both, the election is expected to come down to just six key battleground states. So when you hear about national polling, you can take a look at it, but you're probably going to want to spend more time focusing on these states here. They're going to be Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. This table shows you how all the states that are not considered safe are rated by the rating sites. And it's going to be those six states that are considered the toss-ups. But but how do we get to this point with Biden and Trump? Well, for that, we'd have to go back to late last year. And here's the Wikipedia overview for the entire Democratic primary process. And we can see right now there was really no contest. Biden had about 87% of the vote. Now, the problem for Democrats is they didn't really have an actual primary. There was a lot of controversy late last year and into early this year where Biden was pretty much expected to be the presumptive nominee. Of course, he's the incumbent, but he does have significant vulnerabilities. So there were no extremely high profile Democratic politicians in office that challenged Biden. But at the beginning, you did have Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who later ran as an independent. You had Marianne Williamson, you had Dean Phillips, and much of the discussion back then was, these are not legitimate candidates. And it's pretty much just Biden all the way. Probably the worst thing they could have done was not have any debates. That probably would have saved them a lot of the trouble they're having right now with the fallout from that first general election debate. So Biden is the nominee. However, given the recent debate and some Democrats even calling for Biden to step aside, it's not as clear if Biden is actually going to be the nominee. Here's the recent market unpredicted, and Biden is at about 60 cents. His VP Harris is just above 30. There's been a lot of volatility in this market over the past week and a half. We'll cover that debate in a couple of minutes, but for right now, Biden has been defiant, and he says he's staying in the race. So let's go to the other side. We've got Donald Trump as the Republican nominee, and his percent of the vote there is at about 76. And I think the Republicans at least conducted a more robust process. Nikki Haley eventually emerged as the more establishment-friendly runner-up. She was even able to capture Vermont. Vermont and Washington, D.C. Plenty of other candidates ran, but Trump really does have a hold on this party as well as this nomination. He did not participate in any debates, which I think is unfortunate, and it's especially odd that both major party candidates have a lot of voters that don't want to see them as the nominee, yet neither of them actually debated anybody. But this is going to be the third straight election that Donald Trump is the Republican nominee. You'd have to go back 12 years to find somebody not named a Trump on the ballot. Now, Trump has his own set of issues. We'll come back to that in a moment. But one big decision decision we're still waiting on from the Trump camp is who is he going to pick as his running mate? That has changed a lot from earlier in the year. Right now, if you take a look at Predicted, the only three candidates in double digits are Doug Burgum, J.D. Vance, and Marco Rubio. Tim Scott, who I long thought would be the choice and who had a lead for a long time up until a couple of months ago, he's fallen down to fourth place with Glenn Youngkin. So if it is Burgum, Vance, or Rubio, there's going to be different strengths and weaknesses for each of these picks. Trump might announce this any day now, or he can wait until the convention. That's a huge unknown that it could technically boost the Trump ticket a little bit, or it could have the opposite effect and completely backfire. So we've got Biden and we've got Trump, but we also have third party candidates. If we get back on Wikipedia, we can see that the Libertarian Party has Chase Oliver as their nominee, and the Libertarian Party has decent ballot access, that's why he's going to be listed first. But we've also got the Green Party, and they've got Jill Stein as their nominee. Their ballot access is not quite as strong as the Libertarians, but you might remember Jill Stein from her run in 2016. A lot of Democrats thought she'd peel away enough voters from Hillary to keep her out of the White House. Now, if we go down just a little bit further, we're going to get to the highest profile candidate not named Biden or Trump. I had mentioned he initially ran as a Democrat challenging Biden for the nomination, but Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has since become an independent. So there's an ongoing debate about if Kennedy would damage Biden or Trump more in the general election. Given for most of his life, he was a Democrat and an environmental lawyer. The initial reaction is he would have to take away more from Biden, but he does have a few views that don't fit neatly into the Democratic body and those issues might be more appealing with Republicans. Now, Kennedy has polled higher than everybody else that's not Biden or Trump, but since he's the biggest threat to the two major parties, both of them don't want to have anything to do with Kennedy. Generally, I think if anybody goes outside the two established parties, they're either going to be ostracized or subject to smears. I would say a lot of that probably has happened with Kennedy, but he is in this race to win it. More on him in a minute. Now, after Kennedy, you do have other third parties. We've got Randall Terry and the Constitution Party, and we've got Cornell West, another independent.
independent. There's more down below, but the ballot access is going to be one of the key barriers for all these different campaigns. If you get on Ballotpedia, this will show you the process it takes to get on the ballot in the different states. So first it has the criteria for the major party candidates, but then it has the independents. And the process is different in every state, but for the most part, it requires gathering signatures. Now the amount and the date that you do this is going to vary from state to state, but if you're wondering why Kennedy or some of the other candidates might not be on the ballot just yet, this table might be able to help you out. So since Kennedy is the most high profile, if we get on his campaign website, he has a ballot access tracker. So he already does have some ballot access, but you can also click on any of these states. It'll show you the number of signatures he needs as well as the deadline. So we're trying to track ballot access between the candidates. It can be confusing. If you get back on Wikipedia, they do have a table here that tries to make it simple. On this one, Kennedy is kind of in the middle. And this is the kind of thing that could be changing day to day. But that's another way to see who's on which ballot in the different states. Now, one last thing that might be hurting Kennedy. He has had to spend a lot of time in court. From what I can tell, most of it seems to be Democrats challenging his status on the ballot in various states. The presumption is if Kennedy's on the ballot, he's going to hurt Biden. So he's been under intense scrutiny from that side and his progress has slowed down. And I think the easiest thing for Kennedy to do would be to just drop out. So the fact that he's actually sticking it out and he says he's going to be on the ballot in every state, that is admirable that he hasn't just thrown in the towel. So that's kind of where things are at with Kennedy. Now let's get into some of the baggage. We'll get to Biden, but first we've got Trump. And since the last time I did this video in April, Trump has been convicted in the New York hush money case. That happened at the end of May, and he was supposed to have sentencing on July 11th, but it looks like that has been postponed until September. So Trump was pretty much tied up in court throughout April and May, and that has drained a lot of his finances. Now I think the conviction has hurt Trump a little bit. Maybe it gets overturned on appeal. Maybe it fades from memory, but in the immediate aftermath, I think it turned off a small segment of independence. Now there's other cases for Trump that are happening, but a lot of them might not take place until after the election, if at all. And you can track those cases right here, and as always, all the links will be down below in the description. But as I said, a lot of this has been a big financial hit for Trump. And if you want to take a look at campaign financing, we can get back on Ballotpedia. So this goes back to 2021. And for the most part, Biden, the incumbent, has had the advantage with fundraising. Now, the gap has narrowed up as of late. But if we go down here to the chart that shows the spending, then we can see that Biden is way ahead of Trump. And then the last one is the cash on hand. And we can see that Trump has the advantage. So Biden has already spent a lot on this campaign, including a lot of TV ads. And Trump might just be waiting until the final two or three months to start unloading some of his cash. So that takes us into the presidential debates. So there were originally supposed to be several debates planned in September and October. Those were going to be held by the Commission on Presidential Debates. So those are pretty much canceled, but Biden and Trump agreed to have two debates so far. The second one is scheduled for September if that actually happens. And of course, we all know about the one that happened on June 27th in Atlanta. And the way I view that debate is Biden lost it. Trump did not win it. But the fallout seems to be it was a complete train wreck for Biden. He just looked really old and unfocused. And again, he should have debated in the primaries. But the fallout from that is still going on. Given that was such an early debate, there's still technically time to replace Biden if he wants to step aside. He has said he's sticking it out, but of course that could change at any point. So the next big thing coming up is next week. That's going to be the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. It's going to start July 15th, and it's probably going to be all the usual stuff of discussing the speakers and the party platform. But I think the reveal on Trump's running mate could be the most important thing if that ends up happening. Then a month later, we've got the Democratic National Convention. That's going to be in Chicago. And that has a lot of question marks as well. Is Biden actually going to be the nominee? Is anybody going to challenge him? And what about protests and unrest outside of the convention? So a lot of unknowns, but we're going to see what happens. So that kind of brings us into the polling. So if we look at the national aggregate polling on Real Clear Politics, we can see that Trump is ahead by 3.3. And he's tied or leading in every one of these polls going back to late June. And if you look at the graph down below, you can see that Biden was ahead last summer, but pretty much ever since then, Trump has held the advantage. It got close to tied in April, but ever since that debate, Trump has widened his gap. Now, this is just a two-way matchup between Biden and Trump. If we go out to the three-way race and throw Kennedy into the mix, then we can see Trump has a similar lead. It's at about 3.8. Kennedy pulls in 13%, but some of these polls do go back into May. Now, if we go out to a five-way race and throw in Cornell West and Jill Stein, then Trump's lead increases to 4.8. Stein and West generally get about 1 to 2 percent. I think it's also important to note that Libertarian candidate Chase Oliver is not in this five-way race. Now, that's the polling for the national popular vote. And of course, in the last election, Biden won that by about four and a half points, but he narrowly won the election in the key battleground states. If we look at the average polling of the seven battlegrounds, there we could see Trump has a four-point lead. His narrowest state is going to be Michigan. Now, if Trump wins everything he won last time, but flips Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona, he's still going to be just short of winning the election. 
So a lot of the focus is going to be on those three Rust Belt states. And considering how we're not used to seeing Trump leading in any of these polls, especially nationally, it does look like a very different election than 2020. But polling is not everything. And of course, in a lot of the special elections we've seen, Democrats have overperformed. And in the 2022 midterms, Republicans did not deliver the goods. They did not win the Senate and some key governorships, and they only narrowly flipped the House. So there's that, as well as Trump being underestimated in most of the polls in his first two runs. That's something for each side to be hopeful about. But if we get back and predict it and see where people are putting their money, right now Trump is at about 60 cents, Biden is at about 28, and Harris is at about 16. So ever since the debate, the chaos has been on the side of the Democrats and what they're going to do about Biden. So because of that, Trump has increased in some of the polls, as well as his expectation to win on the market. So that's pretty much where things are at. And we've come a long way on this general election. If we go back a year ago, this is what most people predicted was going to happen. But back then, there was a lot of talk about who's actually going to challenge Biden and Trump. There was endless discussion about different candidates getting into the mix. There was a lot of talk about no labels and if the baggage of Trump and his trials is going to drag him down. And what about Biden's age? How much of a liability could that be? Well, we got some of those answers over the past couple of months. Trump got convicted. He might have sank a couple of points. Then Biden had the poor debate performance and he probably sank a couple of points as well. But given we still have three to four months to go, plus the convention's coming up and probably an October surprise or two, there's no way I can predict what's going to happen. If you think things are just going to stay the same and Trump is going to coast to victory, I would say you're probably being naive. Biden could easily put out executive orders. And even though it's very difficult, he does have time to recover his image after the debate. Now, age, I don't think is going away and that's going to hurt him. Now, even though Trump is only a few years younger, he comes off as decades more youthful. But Trump does have a ton of baggage to deal with. You could say that a lot of it is politically motivated and some of it's totally unfair. But the bottom line is what's going to happen to the swing states? What's going to happen with independence? And how motivated are the bases going to be to come out for both of these candidates? A lot of that is going to be because of the different key issues. Most of them do favor Trump, but especially inflation and immigration. Biden's best issue is going to be abortion for sure. He's got to paint Trump as a threat to democracy, but I don't know how much weight that holds if Biden is considered weak by a lot of the members of his own party, if he might be his own biggest barrier to saving democracy. So there's a whole lot going on in this election. I always encourage people to be prepared for things to change. I think there's a lot of disaffected and low propensity voters out there that aren't going to really start paying attention until the very end. They could change things in a hurry in the final few weeks. Plus, there's probably going to be all kinds of controversy around ballots, voter ID, drop boxes, signature verifications, accepting ballots after election day, how long it takes to count everything, etc. Unless it's close to a landslide, I don't really think either side is just going to totally accept the results. I can easily picture hearing voter suppression or voter fraud or election interference from Russia, big tech, the deep state, etc. It's probably going to be a mess, but that's a deep dive into this 2024 general election. So let me know in the comments, what do you think about anything that led up to where we are now? How about those presidential primaries? What about Kennedy and the other third parties? What about Trump's running mate and is Biden going to be the nominee? And what do you make of Trump leading in most of the polls? Do you think that's going to stay the same or do you think it's going to change by election day? Let me know down below on your way out. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Join if you'd like to help support the channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.